Hey golfers, and welcome back to another episode of the Second Swing Thoughts podcast. Today we've got the Larry Bobka back with us uh, for a fun episode today. Not necessarily fitting related. Um, well, it is kind of fitting related in a way, but um, if you don't know, Larry's got a fun uh, past career of working with tour pros directly as a uh, member of the team at, well, Wilson, UST, Golf Shass, and then Titleist. Right. So we're going to go through that a little bit. And Larry is going to explain, you know, some of the guys he worked with um, and maybe go into detail on some of the fun, unique club builds that he got to experience in the past. So. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, if you go back to the Wilson days, back to the, you know, early, early 80s, early to mid 80s when I started there was... You know, we had Tom Kite, Hale Irwin, Andy Bean, Jerry Pate, um, you know, then eventually Payne Stewart on the staff. But, you know, we at one time, I, you know, Wilson was the number one iron on tour mm -hmm. and the number one wedge on tour. So, yeah, I mean, especially during the Western Open time, uh, you'd have a lot of guys coming through the factory. Um, I traveled with the tour. Um, so, yeah, there's, yeah, there did a lot of things. You know, yeah. um, you know, and then UST with the shafts, spent a lot of time with uh, Lanny Watkins and, you know, we had Mark Brooks play, Mark Brooks played the shaft, uh, mm -hmm. Scott for Plank, you know, a few guys played the shaft and then, you know, went to work for Titleist in 1995 and, you know, yeah. You know, a couple of guys like Tiger Woods and Davis Love. You know, yeah, just a I mean, couple. I think, yeah, yeah, I think we've, I yeah. think we, I think we've heard of both of those guys. They've, done, and, they've won a few times. Yeah, and David Duval, and you know, and the handled work with the LPGA players too. So yeah, it's you know, it's quite extensive. So I guess. was your role with each of those, um, you know, each of those companies similar in that you were? Because I remember you've explained it to me before as if you were kind of a quote unquote liaison between the tour pros and sort of then the yeah the build staffs of the, of the companies. yeah when I started when I started at Wilson they were they were looking for somebody who was who was versed in golf and wanted to they wanted to get somebody who could work between the engineers and the tour players to understand what the players want because sometimes engineers don't mm -hmm. necessarily hear what the players are saying or understand what they're saying. Um, you know, mm -hmm. real quick story is, I mean, I interviewed with like four or five people and I'm like, there's no chance in the world they're going to hire me for this, you know, and just the, you know, just the club pros teaching a bunch of lessons and had my own repair business on the side, like there wasn't a chance in the world and they hired me and I'm like, well, you know, I guess you get lucky sometimes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so it was, it was an interesting role and then it morphed into more club design later on because they're like well you're the one who's talking to him why don't you just do the mm -hmm. why don't you just do the shapes now like when i did metalwoods uh you know hey that was basically here's the shape you know <laughs> you guys figure out how right. to make it fly you know this is this is what it needs to look like you guys figure out how to make it fly because right. that's you know that <laughs> they yeah i'm 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 not the guy for that sure Okay. Well, because I was I was curious because like I was gonna ask like what your typical day or week would look like during the tour season. Like, because you mentioned you were traveling sometimes, sometimes you weren't. So yeah, if you I'm were if you were at an event, let's say you know, and there's obviously like back with Wilson, for example, there was several players that are playing Wilson irons or wedges. So what did a day look like for you? Say you know the Tuesday or Wednesday before a tour event when you're on the ground? Well, Tuesdays were always the busiest. Okay. And I don't care whether it was Wilson, UST, or Titles. Okay. Tuesday, because that's, that's usually the player's big practice day. That's yep. the day they work a lot. So, you know, so now you're, you know, depending on the time you're, you're at the golf course, anywhere from maybe 6 or 6.30 in the morning till, you know, till dark. Yeah. And in the long summertime, it's... That could be 9.30 p.m. Yeah, it could be a very long day. Uh, and depending on if somebody's struggling with some. So basically you're, you know, if, if there wasn't anything specific that I was working on with somebody, then you're just kind of checking up with them, yeah. seeing what they, seeing what's going, see if they need any changes. You know, do they need a little grind on a wedge? Do they need a little grind on the irons? Hey, how are the new irons? Following up on, you know, new sets of irons, new drivers, whatever. 
but then there's you know there's times where you're specifically okay so that's you know you leave the house you leave on sunday you yeah. get to the tour event you know either sunday night maybe monday morning sometimes uh, and you're there. You're there through Wednesday. Maybe stay. Maybe stay over Wednesday night and fly back on Thursday. But then you're back in. You know. Then you're back in the. You know. The tour department working on something for somebody. Because first of all, you know, you don't want to let it go away. Because oh, by the way, you know, I got it in my head. I got the vision of exactly what they want. This yeah. is. This is. You've just how, been talking to these guys. All yeah. Week this is how we're gonna make it. And you know, I always had a way of promising things way too fast um you know oh oh you're playing next week i'll bring it next week you know and then you're in there on friday afternoon or saturday morning working on something you're like why the heck didn't i just tell them two weeks instead of one week but i guess it's part of the service and part of you know part of the reputation you get for doing things quickly and accurately and um you know so i i guess i sure well and you know you know, I'm 63 now. When you're 33 or 34, yeah. it's a heck of a lot easier to do it. You know, now it's like, geez, I have to go home and take a nap, and then so you come, probably wouldn't. Then you probably wouldn't take it. that role again now. Well, yeah, but I do still do. You do a lot anyway. I do a lot player, anyway, so. and I do some crazy things. So yeah, why? But <laughs> but that see, but that to me is that's the service aspect. Yeah. So really, you know, having working here at Second Swing now, when we do some special things for people or get the orders put in or whatever, it's no big deal. I've been doing this for, yeah. you know, I mean, we're going on, we're going, you know, over 40 years of yeah. taking care of people like this. So it's not that big a deal to me. So how many, like, let's say you were talking about one of those Tuesdays prior to a tour event, how right. many players would you work with in that one day? I mean, I know it maybe varies a little bit, but... Well, depending on who it was and what they needed, it could go from one to a dozen, mm. you know? It could, it, it, it just all varied. It, it's, you know, one of the things that is, is working out on tour, you need to be very flexible. Yeah. Because, quite frankly, it's about them. It's not about me. You can, you it's can, also, yeah. it's, yeah, no, I mean... Story. Yeah, and they're getting ready. Yeah, they're getting ready for they're getting ready for their event, and mm-hmm. it's Tuesday afternoon. And you know, hey, in a, depending on the time of the year, we're getting ready for a major. We're at a major, or hey, we need to make some money to keep our card. You know, so that so that the their sense of urgency is always there based on where they are, where their status is. Mm-hmm. My sense of urgency comes with. Hey, I want to get this done. I want to get it done right. Um, you know, and, and being okay, I would say somewhat of a perfectionist. My wife would say a total perfectionist. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I I like things to be perfect because I like somebody. I like to do a set of clubs for somebody, and somebody else that they're playing a practice round, pull them out, look at them, and go. Hey, can you make me a set of these? Yeah. These are really good. I really like these. You know, I remember the time I met a set when, when uh, Greg Norman, the whole sale of Cobra and everything came down. He became a Titleist uh, staffer, and I did a set of I did a set of irons for him. And he was playing practice round with Jack Nicholas at Memorial when Jack was still playing. Um, or no, actually the PGA it was. I think it was Valhalla. And Jack pulls these out, looks at me. Man, these are really good. He's like, "Who did these for you?" And he points at me and he goes, "That guy." <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Jack looks at me and he goes, "I know you, don't you?" Yeah, you know, in typical some of the players, you know, you have to introduce yourself a yeah. few times. But yeah, but to me that's cool. I mean that you know that's where you you go sit at dinner and the steak tastes a little better and the <laughs> the red wine tastes a little better because Jack Nilikas goes, "Wow, these are cool. These are yeah. cool. This is a really good set of clubs." So, okay, see, I didn't even, know, I, I know you've worked with some really big names in, in your career. Uh-huh. Um, I did not know about the interaction with Jack Nicholas. So, uh-huh. I guess in terms of the, I don't know if it's the Mount Rushmore of golfers or, you know, the, the when you think of golf greats, you, you have worked with or been in contact with a lot of those big names. That almost, are up there. Yeah, almost all of them. You got Jack, you've got yeah. Tiger, very closely worked with him. Tiger. 
Um, um, you know, David Duvall in his heyday, mm -hmm. Payne Stewart later in his career did some stuff for Sam Snead, did, did stuff for Seve. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, pretty much, yeah, pretty much the who's who of yeah, good it, players. That's, so. uh, that's a pretty cool list. Right well, there. and it's a and cool it's, list, but it, you know, the cool part about it is it just, it just increases your encyclopedia of knowledge. You know, I always looked at it as, and, and there was times, especially when younger in career, when, you know, one of the, when Bob Benjello would go, hey, I'm busy, can you go help Seve with wedges? I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do this, you know? It's Seve, you know, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm ready to do this, <laughs> you know, and you go in there and you just kind of learn and you do it. And, you know, so there were times I probably was thrown to the wolves for a couple of reasons. One, nobody else was <laughs> available to do it. And two, how am I going to learn? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's why I always feel very fortunate that I, that I've always worked for people that have been willing to, to help teach and help me grow as grow as a, as you know as a club jockey whatever you want to call it and, and learn by doing you know mm -hmm. so um, yeah so you know you're sitting there grinding wedges for Sebi and he's you know he's looking at the bounce and we had these big rubber mats and he's hitting them on these big rubber mats to make marks and he's like no 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 take a little more here take yeah. you know so yeah you know but you just learn. So then, sure. so then you go now and somebody goes, well, I want this, I want that. I'm like, well, yeah, you think it's unique, but I've seen it before. <laughs> so that's kind of what we now want to get into now as well. Let's start on the one end of the spectrum. Maybe like the easiest player to work with. You know, maybe like the easiest, I guess, recognizable name. And I know recognizable is different in your scope than maybe the average listener or viewer of this. But you know, a bigger name that was very easy for you to work with, whether it was Wilson or Titleist, or maybe it wasn't necessarily on staff, but it was just someone that you built some clubs with. Easiest player to work with. You know, you probably got to go, you know, Payne, Payne Stewart wasn't hard. Mm -hmm. You know, Payne was pretty easy. You know, he pulled a set of irons off the rack and won the, won the 89 PGA and the 91 US Open with him. So that would, you know, so that, that makes it easy for you. Then. Yeah, <laughs> but also, but then I designed the whale driver that he won. So, um, y yeah, he wasn't he wasn't that difficult, mm -hmm. and he and he and he pretty much know what he wanted, and he wasn't he didn't get too caught up on a few things. He just knew how he liked he wanted it to look, and how he wanted to fly and feel. So, uh, you know, I would say in the Wilson days, it was probably him. Um, you know, same thing with Davis. I mean, Davis during the Titleist years wasn't, you know, everybody's like, oh my gosh, you know, because he played Tommy Armour 845. Yeah. And then at the end, he was playing Mizuno irons because, you know, he wanted to play blades. He didn't feel like he was getting the feedback. He was, you know, so it was like, hey, you need to go down to fly, fly down to Sea Island and spend a couple of days with Davis and figure out how to handle him. And it's like, you know, what do you want to look at? What do you want to, what do you want to see? What do you, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just go, I'll just go create that, mm -hmm. you know, and you just go create it. And then was it perfect the first time? No. And then you tweak it a little bit and, you know, goes out and wins the PGA with them at Wingfoot. Yeah. You know, just that small little tournament. Well, and you also <laughs> have to, you know, yeah, but you also have to have, you also have to have the, I don't know, for lack of a better term, the intestinal fortitude to not have your ego bruised that I've made you a set of clubs and you don't think they're perfect. Yeah. Because again, it's, it's, you know, to me, this is what I thought you wanted. And then you take, and he goes, well, can you take a little here? Can you take a little there? Blah, blah, blah. This word. Okay. Well, that's just your job. You know, you, you can't be, you can't think that you've made somebody a perfect set of golf clubs. I mean, I make myself golf clubs, and sometimes I still look and go, man, man, what was I thinking there? You know, <laughs> geez, I, I don't, you know. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of like with the LB1 irons, you know. Started yeah. the process, and, you know, you have it down, and all of a sudden you're like, eh, no. And I usually, I, I learned one thing that when, especially like when you're making models and masters and things like that, do them 
put them down for the night, come back the next morning and take a look at them. You might have a different opinion on them. You might have a different opinion. In the, yeah, I might have a different opinion after you sleep on them a little bit or you <laughs> come back and you see something you missed because maybe you're working on them and you're getting a little tired. And yeah, you know, so I, I'm always, always like the idea of, you know, sleeping on it and coming back and tell me, yeah. let's see what it looks like. Sure. Um, yeah, because that's, that's fascinating too. And I even imagine, I'm, I'm sure sometimes too, you might have had like you've built a set of irons or built a wedge for a player and again you thought it looked great or whatever and then you bring it to this player and they point out something and you're like oh, you yeah. know why why did i yeah. do that <laughs> yeah oh well, you know and you had i've had players you know i hate these okay well let's find you yeah. something you don't the, hate yeah and any it, ego there probably is no good because well yeah uh, you yeah. quickly i mean these guys again they're playing for lots of money that's their it's their it's their livelihood their career they're playing for if these little things matter a lot. Well, it's like Hale Irwin. I mean, you know, I think I've told the story before, you know, Wilson, you know, when the Ping Zing came out, the engineers were like, oh, we got this prototype five iron with this high toe weight and the sole looks funky and whatever, and it tests great on the robot. And I remember showing it to Hale, Hale Irwin at the tour event, and he looks at it and he goes, I go, are you gonna hit it? And he goes, no. I go, why not? He goes, cause I hate the way it looks and I'll leave the adjectives out. <laughs> I hate the way it looks. And he goes, tell him, tell him, tell him if I have to play this, I, I quit. I won't play this. You know, and I'm like, okay, Hale. I, I go, why is that? He said, Larry, he said, think about this. He goes, if I'm standing on the 18th hole, the 72nd hole, of the US Open and I got a five iron in my hand and I need to knock it on that green, I ain't looking at that. Mm -hmm. I don't care all the technology in the world. It can be the greatest club ever designed in the history of golf. But if I can't put it down behind the golf ball and have any confidence with it, pretty good chance I'm not gonna pull off that golf shot. Mm -hmm. And you know, you learn that earlier in your career. You learned that almost 40 years ago. And you sit there and you kind of got going, okay, you know, add that to the checklist. Yeah, right. Add that to the checklist of what players want to see and what they want to look at. And, you know, how, how, does, it, how does it feel? Yeah. You know? Is that look and feel element? Do you, is that, do tour pros weigh that? And does it impact them more than now that you've been fitting amateurs? Does that matter more to the tour pros? The look yeah, and feel aspect? I, yeah, and yeah, and kind of no disrespect to any of our customers, but you know, we fill out, we have the players fill out the form yeah. before they come in, and a lot of them, as far as look and feel, mark kind of indifferent. Or yeah. Doesn't matter. Oh, like you never have a tour player yeah. that would mark indifferent. It's <laughs> all about look. It's all about look and feel. So I think that's where it's a little bit different. Um, I think maybe now younger players, younger tour players are not as caught up as, as some of the older players were because back then it was, you know, it was more forgings. Mm -hmm. Clubs were more similar that, you know, finally when Ping brought out I2s and people started playing them, uh, things changed a little bit. But, you know, these guys, a lot of these guys, you know, a lot of the guys, the older players, they did, their, they did a lot of their own work. You know, they did a lot of regripping. They did a lot of reshafting. They did, you know, they worked on their they worked on their clubs, you know, a lot more than younger players do now. And you know, quite frankly, there's so much more. There was so much more to do to a golf club, especially on the wood side. I mean, we got you got to refinish the face. Oh, the, we're not hitting it as good. You know, there's not, you know, there's no adjustability back then. You know, you got to get out there with the file and put some more loft on your driver. And <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that was you know. That was, that was, you know, that was like sculpting where now it's just like, just yeah, turn you, and you just turn it. Yeah, just screw a wrench in, change it, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So it's a little different um, from that standpoint. You know, irons, irons are fairly similar because you're still bending them. Yeah. You know, maybe changing the loft, changing the, the loft and the lie a little bit for somebody and, and 
you know, I think I think one of the things that players do is they will spend because because they're such good ball strikers, they know when a club's a little bit off. Okay, and 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 I don't mean that that you know we get these you you order a set of clubs or you build a set of clubs for somebody. And the lofts are maybe three three to four degrees different yeah. in, in lofts. The lie angles kind of match up to what they wanted, blah, blah, blah. But then they go out in the range and hit them. And then there's adjustments. So it's not that big. Hey, so my five iron's a little bit stronger than I wanted it to be. But oh, by the way, it fills the gap correctly. You know, they don't get caught up that something might be a half a degree or a degree more upright, the six iron to the seven iron. They just want it to fly, right? right? You know, and it, it, it's clubs. They're individuals, yeah. you know? You, you can you can design them as well as you can. You can pure the shaft. You can do all the, I was going to say <laughs> but I shouldn't <laughs> say it, that, that we, that, you know, that we do now. All the science stuff you can do now. But to me, it's still a paintbrush. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still going to be a little different. Yeah. It's not, it's not a perfect beast. And you're going to have to maybe just tweak it a little bit to make it perfect. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that makes it perfect is, is if I'm standing out there and I need to hit it 160 yards and six irons my 160 yard club and I need to fly it next to it, that's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, it seems like that's becoming more of the, the first thought for players nowadays too, is just give me the right distance, give me the right flight. And it's all that matters. Right. So, I mean, you know, you've yeah. heard me say it multiple times. I mean, it's a scorecard. It's not a postcard. Yeah. No That's pictures, true. no style points. I think a lot of us are thankful for that, too. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I played in a, scram played in a scramble the other day with with Aaron Roth, one of our other great fitters, and Chandler Withington, who's now doing, you yeah. know, ex Hazel Team Pro and who's doing all those beautiful paintings and stuff. And, you know, we had a back pin at Minneapolis, and they're standing there going, well, we're going to do this. Uh, well, you know what? I'm just going to kind of hit a little slider six iron back there to about 10 feet, you know? Doesn't matter what club I hit, yeah. you know? I hit two clubs, I hit two clubs more than they did, but I took a different route. I just saw the shot and I hit the shot. Yeah. I don't care if I hit it with my five iron, my six iron, my seven iron, what, it doesn't matter to me. It's where we needed to hit it and we made birdie. Yeah, birdies, birdies are good. Birdies are good. Um, the craziest club that you've been, well, that you've built as a result of a request from a tour pro? Whew. That's a really good question. I wasn't expecting that one today. Um, Is there some? Well, you know, I, I would say there's a couple crazy clubs. And let me, let me, let me, do, let me do two stories. Okay. okay. Crazy club. When we decided Metalwoods at Wilson back in the late, 80s when Metalwoods were starting to take over. Joe Phillips, the, the VP of promotions, like, hey, we got to make this, we got to make this, we got to make an oversized Woodwood. What are you talking about? We're going we're gonna to make a Woodwood as big as we can. Well, it, it turns into the Wilson Whale, you know, laminated, oversized. I mean, now I look at it and it doesn't even look as big as a three wood does these days. But you look at it, and it was large, had a hole in the body, it had some perimeter weighting to it. And, you know, and I remember Payne Stewart's first reactions, like, you know, once the laughter stopped, he's like, seriously, you want me to, Payne, do me a favor. Just, <laughs> you know, you got young kids at home, it's my job, man, just take a couple of these things. You know, and he ends up winning the 89, he wins the 89 PGA at Kemper Lakes. Wins the 91 U.S. Open at Hazeltine, playing the driver. In fact, I got video of him on 18 at Hazeltine in the third round, hitting driver, driver on the fringe and two putting to stay tied for the lead. You know, that was a crazy design back then. Yeah. You know, um, so you're you're sitting looking at that, going, "Wow," you know, and and it worked out for him. So he didn't really ask for it, but. We got it. it was, you know, we got him to play it. Was that 
at the time probably a pretty radical move. Yeah, it was to go, huge. Yeah, to yeah. Go, that was it. Was his reaction of laughing at it, you know? And was that pretty common among tour players? Like, okay, we're not actually going to play. Yeah, this we're thing. not actually going to play this. The sa- I remember sales and marketing going, "You're gonna, you're making what?" <laughs> They're like, "No, no, no, we want metal ones, you know, because Taylor <laughs> yeah, makes. Yeah, because that was. Taylor, yeah, Taylor made's coming on with Burner series and every. No, we want, we want, we want metal ones. Well, we're working on some metal ones which were the ultra tour metal ones that I did. But it's like, hey, let's try this. No, we, we don't want it. We don't want it. Then all of a sudden he wins the PGA, and it's like, how many of those can you make? <laughs> how many of those can we make? It's like, we got it figured out. But, it, you know, there there's a product where, you know, you kind of see a need. It's a little different. You know, it's kind of like when, I'm sure, when Ely Callaway's sitting there going, hey, we're going to make the original, we're going to make the original Big Bertha. You know, it doesn't look big anymore, but back then it was big. But it also fit the need that it was easy to get up in the air. Mm-hmm. So now all of a sudden you got tons of people buying it because, first of all, most people are buying it because they were playing Woodwoods and they couldn't hit it in the air anymore. Because then that, you also got to remember that was the time when the golf balls were changing That's too. true. You know, now all of a sudden golf balls are starting to get harder and lower spinning and so you know it, it kind of goes up and back as you know clubs changed a little bit as the golf ball changed yeah, too. I suppose it's yeah. kind of a need right I mean, yeah the golf ball if it gets lower spinning it doesn't fly yeah the golf clubs then have to sort of make up for that yeah I so that so that tradition. was probably the you know that was probably one of the craziest and you know the other one i think was the the 962 beats mm. you know because David Duval was on staff at time, and Tiger was there, and Davis was there, and we were starting. Titleist was starting to move away from DCI and go towards forgings, but we had signed him as a DCI guy because we were still selling a lot of DCIs, you know. And he's like, "Well, I don't like the other. D- you got to make, you know, we got to make this DCI that I can play, you know." And and Peter Gilbert was the head of Iron Design at the time, and great guy, smart, really smart guy. I think he builds boats now. He does some really important, you know, really cool stuff. But I said, hey, I said, Peter, we got to make an iron for Duval. You know, and he goes, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, can we make it? Can we make a cast club? with the same center of gravities as a, as a forging, you know, same height, same size, same area. He goes, I don't know, I think we can. I think we can do that. He goes, it's not gonna have much of a cavity. I'm like, I don't care. I don't care if it's got much of a cavity. All it's gotta do is look like something, Yeah. you know? And, and he goes, well, what does he want on the sole? And I said, well, we gotta pull the heel off because he's, you know, he's kind of hold on cutter and so we don't want, don't need any heel there at all. And so he goes, well, he goes, let me, let me get something mocked up. See what, see what I can do. See what it might look like. You take a look at the toe and the heel and make sure it's going to look, you know. And let's do offsets just like a forge set. And you know, and, it, and now it's kind of, kind of got this. Uh, you know, you hear about it. it's got a little cult following is like one of the best clubs ever. Well, it, it just fit what it fit what the player needed at mm-hmm. the time. Uh, you know, people grab it and you look at it and it's like, you know, but I'm telling you what, it's like hit it's like hitting a it's like hitting a blade. Yeah. I mean, a six eighty a six eighty one tiger iron, six iron and a in a 962 B6 are just as equally hard to hit. I mean, there's there's no there was no, no forgiveness yeah. in that iron. So you know, it's kind of got this little cold falling. But you know, if you're looking for help, that ain't your golf club. It's not not the one. If you're no, uh, no, if but you're a no, but that was miss hitter. yeah. But that was you know that was you know that was something that turned into a project because hey, I you know, I, I got to be the DCI guy. What you know? What can we do? How can we make it? You know, and nobody, you know, there's been, there's cast blades, yeah. right? But nobody ever tried to make a, 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 a cast blade with a little bit of cavity in it at the time. And, you know, and try to really make 
yeah, what somebody you know, wanted. I mean, cast you know? blades aren't much of a, you know, there's not a lot of them out there anymore. No. Cast blades. No. Mine. Except for the LB1s. <laughs> uh, mine. Which I, I love them. I think they, I think, you know, to me it's more about the design of the club. It's about the center of gravities and it's less about, it's less about yeah. how they're, how they're manufactured. Um, you know, and you go some other crazy clubs. I remember one time, uh, Billy Andre, Brad Faxon and Davis Love were playing a practice round at, at TPC Sawgrass. It was on Tuesday and, and. Wally Uline, you know, the then CEO of Titleist was out there and he comes on the first tee to say hello to the guys and he's looking in the bags and he's like, I saw three clubs in here that I didn't even know we made. You know, couple wedge couple wedges for couple wedges for for the guys have pulled out. That's kind of when we 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 kind of reintroduced the PTs because when I got there, when I got the titles, they were going to just, the PT was ne a, not a very successful product because one, it, it, it was medium launch with low spin. Right. Well, for the average, for the general player, it's probably not the best product. But when I got there, we didn't have any fairway woods. And they're like, I was kind of looking in the back of the factory and John Worcester who ran West Coast Operations, I said, John, I brought, I pulled one out. And I'm like, dude, what are these? He goes, well, these are, these are set to get scrapped. I'm like, no, 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 just send those, because the tour department was in a different location. I said, just put them on the truck and send them over to the tour department. I'll use these things. So, you know, we reinvented those, and, you know, Wally pulls the head cover off Davis's three wood, and he's like, how we got rid of these? Like, no, we didn't. No, we just kind of reinvented them. Um, so, yeah, you know, so there's clubs like that. There's always been clubs like that that all of a sudden you're like, you know, somebody likes something or Billy Andre wanted a, he at the time, you know, he sort of wanted a cavity back wedge that matched his DCI set, but he didn't want it to be a forging, or he didn't want it to be a casting. He wanted it to be a forging. He wanted, he wanted more bounce. He wanted it. Well, I just, you know, kind of we like to call them Frankenstein's. Yeah, I just kind of Frankenstein. That's kind of the word that was in my mind. I kind of Frankenstein yeah. a, a wedge for him, and and you know brought it out, and he played it the week before, and he's like, man, I love this club. It's perfect. So that's something that I don't. I mean, a, a, a cavity back forged wedge. Right. I don't think there's any of those no. out right now, to no. my knowledge. No, there not, is, no, not maybe really. I'm missing one, but I mean, it's so there's those little things. I just I imagine over time there was a few of those, yeah. quote unquote, Frankenstein clubs that you had to, yeah, that they, you were you were building on on behalf of a player that, yeah, to just you know to figure out figure out something for them to you know to kind of meet meet their needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's you know, it's kind of like the you know, I did the. I did the Faxon and the Elkington and the Davis Love wedge, and you know Fax's wedge has got two, you know, took it to production with the the holes drilled in the back. If you've ever seen one, mm -hmm. well, they're like, well, why did you do it that way? It's like, well, because when I made a wedge for him, it was absolutely perfect, but it was too heavy. Well, old school club banking, you go to the back of you go to the back of the sole and drill a couple holes to take, take some take swing some weights. Out. Way, way so out his was like that. So it's like, well, why don't we just introduce it that way? You know, the factory's looking at me going, You want me to you want us to do what? <laughs> yeah, we need to set up an operation so you guys can on the drill press, you guys can drill holes out and you gotta grind it to this certain weight and then you're gonna take you're gonna take two swing weights out with that, and then we're gonna send it off to Chrome. Excuse me, you really want you really want us to drill holes in them? Yeah, I really want you to drill holes in them, because otherwise ah. the shape would get too small. And in fact, was an old Wilson wedge player. Wilson wedges compared to some other wedges are are a little bit bigger. The profile's a little bigger. They're a little rounder. So it's not you know if you look at those wedges. Compared to some other companies, that yeah. you know, there wasn't any, you know, having room left to take any more weight out without ruining the design and the performance. Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, um, I have one more, one more question for you. One more thought before we kind of wrap this up, and that is... It scares if, me sometimes when you have a thought. I, well, you're not the only <laughs> one. Uh, the, I guess, the most satisfying club that you built for a player in terms of the result that it gave them. So you mentioned Payne Stewart, the whale driver, resulting in a couple major wins, helping him get those. Um, is there a pl another player that had immediate success after putting one of maybe your club? Well, I, in the I bag? you know, probably, you know, if, if you're going 1A, if you're going, probably there's a 1A, a 1B, and a 1C. Pain because he was the first, without a doubt. That, yeah. that incredibly satisfying. I mean, I still have pictures on my phone of him, you know, shots of him playing at, at uh, Kemper Lakes with yeah. the with the whale driver. So yes, that was you know that to me and that that was kind of my that was kind of my number one. I mm -hmm. mean, that was really the first thing that I I designed from scratch and and somebody won, much less a golf tournament, but won two majors. Right, a major, yeah. Uh, then you got to go. You got to go with. You got to go with Davis, mm -hmm. with uh, you know the prototype, forged, cavity backs that you know again were just kind of built off of oversized forgings that were ground down. Then we milled a cavity and then we finished them off. Yeah, without a doubt. And he, you know, want, you know, he always wanted to win a major. PGA was great because of his dad's history and. Um, yeah, so that that would be one B, and then you know, I guess you'd have to go with, I don't, not guess, but you got to go with Tiger. Yeah, you know, I mean, that was that was a project that, you know, fit him, and you know, sometimes you look back and you go, man, the guy probably could have played with a broomstick just as well, <laughs> but uh, because of the talent. But on the other side of that, you know, you look at it and you kind of go. You know, I helped, you know, helped win a lot of those majors for him. So yeah, uh, and had a, had had some irons that he was very happy with and performed great. So yeah, I, you know, pretty hard not to, pretty hard not to go to that. And you know, and and I guess you can go in in just taking it one past that. Now, you know, being involved with the the Minnesota Golf. Gophers mm. men's golf team uh, and doing some fitting for those guys and you know just worked really hard on a three wood for one of the new kids and uh, he shot 62 in qualifying yesterday. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty so, saucy. Yeah. So you know <laughs> you kind of sit there and you kind of go well you know it just keeps going and and uh, we kind of we kind of laugh, and you know we had Eric Childs in here with yep. it. So I, you know, those guys, you know, the one A, the one B, and the one C is because we all know them, and they've won major tournaments, and it's really yeah. cool. But on the other side, you know, I, it, it's kind of it's just know, as rewarding. It's absolutely, yeah. you yeah. know, and and actually, uh, a buddy of mine at the Holes for Hope that we were at at Monday, and he's like, you know, he goes. How do you do it? And I'm like, man, I don't know, Tim. I just, I just pull a little foo foo dust out of my out of my <laughs> pocket and I throw them on people, and it works. But on the other side of it is, as a good fitter, as a good tour rep, you're trying to instill confidence in that player, and we all know confidence leads to better golf. So if I can if I can take a guy, whether he's a 30 handicap or a PGA Tour player. Build him what he needs, and also sit there and give him a little bit of a little bit of confidence, or a lot of confidence yeah. that this is going to perform the way he needs it to perform. How do you go wrong? I mean, that's you know, and I I've always you know I've always felt very confident about the things that I've made. Yeah, I always feel very confident about the fittings that I do for players, and you know I always like them to walk out of that bay feeling like, oh my gosh. You know, this is the best club ever. Yeah. Where I can't wait to get my new irons because I know I'm going to play good. And why, you know, that's why, what it's about. Why, yeah. Why wouldn't you want it? You know, yeah. we're just, you know, we're not, I mean, the game's hard enough. Right. Right. And I just, now I'm picturing like there's just, there's a list now, right? There's a list of golfers out there that have been, that have played better golf or achieved something in golf. 
after working with with Larry and I have a ma I have a feeling there's some people watching or listening to this that have been fit by you and well, I'm, I'm, put, I'm putting them on the same list as Tiger Woods and Davis Love and, well, and right why, should, why shouldn't why shouldn't they because <laughs> they don't because you know hey they don't play for a living they're you know they're an accountant they're a dentist or an optometrist they're whatever they were whatever they are and golf's their passion it's just as rewarding to me to see it somebody send me a text message or an email and go man you know I just had somebody the other day and it, you know he's like man I can't tell you uh, I'm just hitting these irons great and he goes I haven't played real well in the last couple of years and he goes you know I shot my best round I shot 74 yeah he goes you know and I just I can't think well I didn't make any of the putts you know I didn't hit the tee shots he did but but if he's standing there understanding and realizing that feeling confident that he's got the best set of irons in his bag you know yeah you've I've done my job yeah. Yeah. you know and, uh, and and that's that's where you know that's where I, I I like people to feel confident about their fitting yeah or what I made them and that's why I always feel confident and that's why I always spend a ton of time even to this day making sure that I'm up on shafts that I'm up on you know manufacturing technologies whatever because I want to make sure I always want to do my homework to make sure I'm giving somebody the best thing that there is you know mm -hmm. and it just you know I've talked about it before it just adds to your encyclopedia yeah it just makes it easier to get somebody done I had a guy that today who's you know kind of aging a little bit not that old I mean he's only a year older than I am so I'm not going to call him old <laughs> by called, any chance you said aging yeah but <laughs> But, you know, had some wrist problems, had some elbow problems, and just, you know, feel, felt like he need, you know, we went to went to a graphite shaft and a, and a Callaway iron, and he's hitting it, and he's going, holy cow, I should have came here sooner. I'm like, yeah, you probably should have. <laughs> you know, he goes, yeah. I, I didn't realize how hard I'm, well, now he's going to want, now he's going to get this set of clubs. He's going to hit them a little bit further. They're not going to hurt his arms. He can practice more. I mean, it gives him everything he needs. Yeah, yeah. To, to play better golf. Well, that's the it, point. Yeah, that's, that's the, the point. point. Whatever the point. level you're playing at, that's the whole point. And that's you know that's one of the things that you know we tell people all the time. You know, and you, sometimes when you tell them and we send the message out and whatever, but till you come experience it, you don't realize. Yeah. The opportunities, and mm -hmm. there's sometimes where, hey, we we've, we've had people come in with a driver, you know, do a set of irons, and they're like, you know, hey, you want to hit a couple drive? Yeah, but I like my driver. They hit their driver, they have a lot of confidence. I'm like, hey, you know, that's really good. Why don't you just keep playing that for yeah. now and see how see how it goes? Yeah, you know, the irons were your big problem, so it's just instill it's instilling confidence, yeah. you know. So part of the job is, you know. Club fitter, club maker, the builder, whole thing. builder slash psych, sports psychologist. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you have a, you know, you've gotten over the years experience as a sports psychologist, but. Um, well, it helps having seven kids. So. Yeah, I suppose too. <laughs> that that all helps. But um, Larry, I know, I know I know about dealing with people that don't want to be dealt. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> fair enough. Um, well, I think. Moving forward, people that schedule fittings with you, they do want to deal with you. So um, that's, if you guys are watching or listening, that's a pretty darn good look at back at some of the highlights of Larry's career. And obviously he's still kicking it today, uh, fitting a second swing. So schedule that fitting, get fit with Larry if you're in the Twin Cities area um, at the Minnetonka store, schedule that online. Um, otherwise, any of our other fitters in any of our stores will be happy to help you. They go through the same yeah. training stuff that Larry does too. So, um, Larry, thanks for joining today. Yeah, and so you know, based on these podcasts, send some questions. Yes, in because you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I think I forgot more stuff than I remember these yeah, days. It's probably true. Maybe hey, if you can give him a question that he forgot. Yeah, if you that, give that's me a question test. forgot yeah. or you you know, but. I, I think that's you know as, as a player, and if you're serious about the game, I think you gotta you, you gotta be you gotta be willing to ask questions, and understand and see what's gonna yeah. make you better. And I don't care what level it's at, and mm -hmm. and 
you know, I, I always encourage people, especially in fittings, hey, what are you thinking? Yeah. You know, a lot of times they're like, well, you really want, you want to know what I'm thinking? Yeah, I want to know what you're thinking. Yeah, so, so if it's all, no, about, it's all no. about them. It's the ego part, right? You put the ego aside. It's, yep. it's about what you want as the golfer. So yeah. go get that fitting, schedule it now, and we'll catch you next time on the podcast.